Today is um, the beginning of a new series. I don't know if, if any of you are aware or not. I don't know if you maybe have seen any ads maybe out there, um, you know, but by any chances. Has anybody seen any political ads lately? Unless you live under a rock, I don't know how you miss them. I mean, inundated with them. It is non-stop. And the last place you want to see them is when you come to church. So I'm going to show them to you anyways. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> now, we're only a month away from the next um, presidential election, and according to the ads, every option, every candidate is evil, wicked, everyone's going to raise your taxes, everyone's going to steal away all your freedoms, everyone's legalizing crime, everyone's a criminal, you know, I mean, and, it just, there's, and the closer you get to the election, the more and the more mudslinging happens, and they just like to make everyone's blood boil, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the, um, the intent, I think. And honestly, I, I don't know of anybody who has ever been persuaded by an ad to change their vote and their stance. Usually it just, you know, solidifies what you're already planning on doing. But beyond these divisions, I'm sad to say another division has come right here in our church. There's a Steelers-Cowboys game tonight, and um, we got a cowboy among us. He's not ashamed of it either, so please pray. Pray for Daryl. In fact, he's going he's gonna to be at the game tonight. Pretty awesome, but anyways. Now, you guys know, if you've been here long enough, you know my stance. I am firmly convicted that this place, this property, this whatever, is a place for Jesus and Jesus alone. You know, that is why we gather here. It's for him. It is for him. So I've always been very cautious and very protective to keep politics out of the pulpit because it just divides people and they're not, I don't know if you guys are planning on those people saving your life, but it's not going to work. Okay, I'll just give you this, this solid, you know, up front, but, but Jesus can. He can bring change into your life. Um, because honestly, nothing causes division and hatred more than American politics. I mean, it just, it, and it just triggers people. However, however, sometimes God has some different ideas. And so what I really felt the Lord leading me to do is to go into a message series, not on politics, but really on the issues. Because every issue that we are facing as a nation, the Bible's very clear about. So, you know, uh, we're going to be understanding the amazing role that we have because we do live in a very unique nation where us as believers are able to have a voice into the political system where our voice actually does matter we have an opportunity to be a part of the political process and we really do miss out if we don't participate uh, we're able to be you know to, to vote and I, I know there's a lot of um, debate about whether that even does matter or not but I'm telling you, it matters. Get out there. Okay, get out there. Get out there and vote. Um, we have an opportunity to be a critical part of selecting our elected officials. We're able to, not only do we get the opportunity to vote and to select them, but we have the opportunity in this nation to actually call them up, email them, text them, and actually share your opinion with them. You know, because I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but it seems like the the squeakiest wheel, the loudest voices in the country today are not the majority. They are the minorities. And that's only because the majorities don't take the opportunity to be a voice into these systems. You know, we're able to see the choices that, that our elected officials make, the way that they vote, the way they represent us, the issues that are important to them, the changes that they make in office, and so much more. Um, now, obviously, our voice has been given to us by God, not for the primary purpose of being political, but for giving him praise, for telling people how good he is, for sharing the good news, for being a disciple and making disciples, you know. But, but we have this opportunity to also be a voice to influence and to affect our nation and those who represent us and those who lead us. And um, we're really failing if we don't uh, do our part to be 
God's voice out there. It seems like in the wilderness these days, you know, calling out to people. So the cool thing is within our, so quick civics lesson, within our stru governmental structure, we are not a democracy, okay? You're going to hear that a lot. We're not a democracy, okay? We are a constitutional republic. Uh, you know, that means that we have certain rights that cannot be taken away no matter how everyone else feels. You know, um, if, if the example I usually use, I'm going to pick on Nate, if, if you know, the uh, Constitution gives him the right to own a bicycle and every other person in the nation votes that Nate should not have a, vote, a bicycle, he is way too reckless on that thing, he's going to hurt other people and hurt himself. Doesn't matter if everyone else in the nation votes to take that away, he has a constitutional right to own that thing, and no one can take it away. That's the difference between democracy and constitutional republic. When the three powers of our American government work as the founding fathers intended them to, the government is representative of its people. Representative. Our nation is a nation from the bottom up, not the top down, right? Unlike God's kingdom, <laughs> which is all top down. It's a constitutional republic that acknowledges that all people were, and you'll You've probably heard these phrases before. Created equal. They are endowed by their creator, capital C, with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I agree with the founding fathers on that one, especially as a Christian. We, we were created with certain rights that nobody should be able to take away. It acknowledges that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And they derive their powers from the consent of the governed. Every time I copy and paste the Second Amendment, it gets taken away from Facebook because it's considered hate speech. But if you read the Second Amendment, you understand why we have the right to bear arms. And it's to form a militia. They consider that hate speech. That's what the Second Amendment says, though. Because if the government fails to represent you, you got the right to overthrow that government. That's, yeah. So I don't know if Facebook's going to take this down, but whatever, there you go. It says that in order to establish justice, we live in a just nation, at least we should, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote general welfare, to secure, to secure the blessings of liberty, the founding fathers of this nation wrote the Constitution that guides our elected officials in their various roles and offices. And it was good. It worked very well. I mean, we're a couple hundred, going 300 years in, and it's working very well. It's a government operates from the bottom up. So to affect who is elected into positions of power and authority, for them to stay in powers of position and authority, the opinions of the people have to be influenced. You have to win over the people because they're the ones that put you there and keep you there. Hence... The barrage of political ads and propaganda that we see everywhere, and you can't escape it. No matter where you go and what you do, they're out there. That's why the control of the news and the media is so at battle, so that we can be influenced. Okay, to further clarify, so that's our little civics lesson. To be clear, faith, faith cannot be forced. Faith cannot, true, genuine faith cannot be forced. Belief cannot be legislated. If it could be, then we would be a very moral and upright nation because we have laws that say it's wrong to kill people. So that means nobody should be killing each other, right? But it still happens. It cannot be legislated. In fact, even though our nation was absolutely formed using the moral compass of Judeo-Christian values, and it's a pretty, the Bible's a pretty good source for morality. I'm glad our founding fathers used it in their wisdom. Our country still values the freedom of religion. To choose your faith and to be free to exercise it however you choose. Specifically, it says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. No law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's what we're here doing this morning. We're here exercising our constitutional rights. It's so awesome. We get the chance to do that. And I got news for you. If tomorrow America decides we don't have that constitutional right anymore, I'm still going to be here. Okay? And prayerfully, you all will be too. 
because we know where our true rights and freedoms come from, right? Not from our government. All right, but it's awesome that we live in a government that does protect it for the time being. Free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right to people to peaceably assemble. As long as we don't get too rowdy, we're good. It's all right if you all get too rowdy. I'll still be good with it. I'll still be really good with it. And to petition the government for the redress of grievances. So, that's where you hear the fallacy of the separation of church and state. The separation of church and state. And what you usually hear that um, in reference to is that religion has no part in the political system. But that is not at all what is literally written here. The separation of church and state is that Congress cannot establish a religion. They can't say, okay, here in America, y'all are going to be Muslim. They can't do that. Thankfully, they can't do that. That also means they can't say that y'all are Christians now. And this is where Christianity and politics gets a little mixy and messy and confusing to people. Because you, you can't do that. It, not, only, not only does our, our um, Constitution forbid it, but it doesn't work. If tomorrow all of our political offices decide that we're going to be a nation of Christians and Christians only, you can't legislate faith. That won't change the hearts of the people. It will not work. It will not work. You cannot force it. Imagine this for a moment. The world that we live in is changed in an instant. I mean, literally imagine this happening. The devil is bound and thrown into a prison. No longer can he influence anyone on the face of the earth. No longer can he lie and deceive everybody. Then Jesus himself steps foot on the earth in Jerusalem. He decides he is now governing the entire earth. Every single one of his judges is a devout Christian who refused to deny Christ, even though it meant that they lost their heads for doing so. This perfect faultless sinless government rules the entire earth for a thousand years it's what we refer to as the millennial reign of christ in fact you'll read about it in revelation 20 this is going to happen now what would happen if after all of that thousand of years when christ rules the earth and rules it perfectly sinlessly no corruption after a thousand years, what would happen if the devil would be released? And he goes around trying to deceive everybody. Surely the people would rise up and revolt against him and put an end to him, right? But we know that's not what happens. As soon as he is released, the Bible says in Revelation 20 that people who number more than the sand on the seashore will follow the devil and join him in battle against God and his people. I mean, if this isn't clear evidence that you can't legislate and govern faith, I don't know what could be. Because there's no, you're never going to find a more Christian leader in a governmental influence than Jesus himself, not only at a national level, but a worldwide level. And still, after the perfect government exists for a thousand years, whew, People still revolt against, G against God, and it's, people are people. And God, because he loves them, he will not force them to choose him. He gives us the option. Life, death, blesses, curses. Faith cannot be forced. Belief cannot be legislated. Okay, so remember that in these elections. These life transformations can only happen from the inside out, and they can only happen as a work of the Holy Spirit, and they can only happen... Not when we the people vote in the right people, but when we the people of God begin to evangelize and reach the lost like we are the people of God. Don't rely on your elected officials to do that work because it isn't their job. It's our job. Our job to, to seek and to save the lost. If we want America to truly be a Christian nation, then that's up to us. And the cool thing is, because America is a government from the top, from the bottom up, the more people that we reach, the more the government will reflect the values of the people. Can you imagine America after a massive revival breaks out and 
hordes of people get saved and spirit-filled and radically transformed by the Holy Spirit. This is going to be more of a nation than it used to be. So, when you vote, vote your values. Vote for the people who are going to represent you. That's what your vote is. You're not voting on behalf of your neighbor. You're voting on behalf of yourself, your values, the people who are going to represent you well, those whose vision for America is the one that you desire to live in. And above all, you need to vote with a clear conscience before God with what you are supporting by your vote. It is so critically important. So with all this in mind, we're going to turn to the issues at hand. Because I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That's your job, your role. But I'm going to tell you what God has to say about the issues. And then you've got to make up your own mind. But you've got to get out there. You've got to get out there and... And be, don't miss out on this opportunity to be a part of this process. Now, by the end of this, I'm going to give you a little preface here, okay? I want us all to be friends and family still after. I'm going to step on the toes of Democrat and Republican. It's not me. This is not my opinion. This is not my belief. All I'm sharing is what the Word of God teaches, because that's my role up here. I'm not preaching any agenda or any politician's stand. I'm not even preaching my own personal stands and convictions. I'm preaching the word of God. So this is what God's word has to say about these issues. And I couldn't cover them all in one message. Oh my goodness, I barely scratched the surface. I'm like, we're going to be here for hours, so I'm just going to cut this thing up. It's going to be a little bit of a series. So, To get started, the whole party system, Democrat and Republican. I mean, Jesus said this. This is from the Amplified and the New Living Translation. If a kingdom is divided, split into factions, and rebelling against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. New Living Translation, a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. And that's a direct quote of Jesus. So why we think it's a good idea to be so divided and then to call ourselves the United States of America, I don't know. It's just... Again, it's the confusion muddled of politics, and I don't understand it. I just can't wait till the Holy Spirit breathes his breath of truth on the political system, and truth is revealed for what it is. My goodness. You see it all the time. There's videos. You can't hide anywhere. There's videos of you. You can't say one thing to this person, one thing to that person, one thing to that person, and still have a stand that we can believe what you say on, you know? And most politicians are guilty of that. But we divided our country intentionally into two party systems, and there's lots of other parties, but, I mean, let's just be honest, they don't seem to matter, they just kind of, a, whatever. I, I was independent when I first, you know, registered to vote, because, but whatever. It's just not a good idea to, to split yourself up and then to rebel against yourself. <laughs> it reminds me of my physical body. I have an autoimmune disease that, that causes diabetes, like, My immune system is fighting my body. It's like, come on, can anything be more demonic? You know, your body fighting itself. You lose. (laughs) You lose. You're not going to win when you're divided and fighting against yourself. And here we are as America, Republican, Democrat, and they're all fighting against each other. And, I mean, I know the Bible says that he who sits in the heavens laughs, but I think some other nations probably laugh at it too, you know? Because they're pretty united because you don't have a choice. Communist, socialist governments, you don't have a choice. You disagree with the government, you die. You know, so they're very united. It's not a good way to be (laughs) by any means, but anyway, so there's the whole take on the whole political system. Anyways, if we think it's a good idea to split up into parties of like-minded people, but Jesus said it's a certain way to fail. And also, with this upcoming election, there's all kinds of rumors, especially here in redneck western PA, of we, the people, that enough, Right? (laughs) And I won't share my opinion on that, but we the people have had enough. There's rumors of potential civil war following the upcoming election, especially if we think the election was not fair, if it was cheated. Because we see the evidence, even though the judges are saying there's no evidence, we know there's evidence of it. And this is regardless of whether you're Democrat or Republican, there's evidence of it. Come on. I I remember I, I looked up a person that was, you know, what was it, 130-some years old, they had died, and yet they voted. Because you can look it up. That's crazy. Like, if I can find that evidence, come on. That was crazy. But, um, but I understand the passion's running high. But again, Jesus said, 
that a kingdom divided by a civil war will collapse. It's, it's, it's not a good idea for us to come out as a united nation. Um, I mean, we did survive one civil war already. I don't know if we can survive another, especially when it's not north versus south. It's like, yeah, we're all over the place. It's not a geographical divide. But now on to the issues. Israel! I don't know if, has Israel been in the news at all lately? Anything happening over there? I remember sitting in my office and I was watching the news and like literally missiles were starting to fly and get intercepted. I'm like, this is happening like right, right now, right there in the world. Like thousands of missiles being launched by Iran. The Bible says this, literally black and white. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed. Whoever curses Israel will be cursed. I mean, it's pretty black and white. I don't know why we need to be divided on this one. If you take a quick look at the history of Israel, either biblically or even from extra-biblical sources, you'll quickly come to this conclusion. It is a miracle that that nation still exists on the face of the earth right now. Tiny, puny little thing. So there has to be something more to this nation than just the people and the land. Whew. There must be a God behind the scenes working on their behalf because there's no other way they could stand up to it. Biblically, consider the account of, I love this one, Balaam, who is a prophet of God. Becky just talked to the, the kiddos last week about this guy and his donkey. But this account, I'm talking about Balaam and Balak, the king of Moab. He hired Balaam to curse the people of Israel. You find this account in the book of Numbers. Because whoever, whoever Balaam would curse, they were cursed. Whoever he blessed, they would bless. So he hired him. He's like, okay. This nation of Israel, they're, they're like destroying everybody. I need you to curse them. I'll give you anything. And he would go to curse them, and he would just start speaking blessings. He's just like, I can't. Like he, It was kind of funny. He literally could not curse the people of God. It just didn't work. Now, the nation of Israel is not perfect. They're far from the people that I believe God wants them to be. I mean, go over there and try telling their people about Jesus and see what happens. It's not going to end very well for you. Yet we... Tell anybody, we have people over there telling them all about Jesus, and it's pretty awesome. Our missionaries over there. I won't call them out because you can't. Their life is at risk if they knew. And we can debate about whether the current democracy of Israel really is still the biblical nation of Israel that was made up of Jacob and his 12 kiddos, you know. Uh, we can debate about that and whatever, but the reality is we're going to keep it simple this morning because regardless of those debates, God made a covenant and God's covenant is not dependent on the people being right and perfect and sinless and and governing as they ought to I mean my goodness look at the Bible from the very beginning the nation of Israel screwed it up we want to be like everyone else we want a king and God's like but but uh, theocracy I want to be your king no we want to be like everyone else Pfft, whatever sometimes God just blesses nations with what they want <laughs> So that they realize, this isn't good. God, your way was better. I should have listened to you. So, yeah, they, they've always screwed it up. But the reality is, God made a covenant. God made a promise. We don't call that the promised land for no reason. That land was promised forever. Until God destroys the elements by fire, that physical land, that nation of God, it belongs to Israel. It belongs to Israel. And sure, there are seasons when it gets taken away from them. But guess what? God always keeps a remnant. He always brings them back from the northeast, south, and west. They remain. In fact, just a few days ago, in front of the United Nations, Netanyahu just gave a speech, and he literally quoted God's word and said, this is God's promise. You know, going back to you know, thousands of years ago with Moses, and he stood, it's so just encouraging, for, for a national leader to stand on the word of God, the promises of God, the covenant of God, and he even held up maps if you saw it, you know, and he's like, this is the blessing, this is the curse. Like, <laughs> you, nations of the earth, you choose. Oh, I don't know, it just stirred something up inside of me. I love it. God defined Israel's borders in Exodus 23. And this might sound familiar. God said, I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And from the desert to the Euphrates River. Is this a little familiar? From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. That was God's promise. God's promise that that land would be theirs, and it still is. 
No matter how much everyone else wants to steal it away and destroy them and kill them, they still stand. So if we want our nation to be blessed, we'll vote for leaders who will bless and stand firmly with Israel. Because all you're doing is agreeing with God, right? I mean, you know, we, we know somebody that recently even moved our embassy to Jerusalem to, to, to declare and proclaim that that is the capital city of Israel, just agreeing with what God said in his word. So that was pretty clear. Next, this is a really fun one. D- does anybody aware that we have some issues at our border? Some immigration things going on? Yeah. It's, it's, it's right here in our backyard. My goodness. Wow. Now, there are three parts of this one, so don't get mad and storm out if you disagree with the first point, because there's others. We're going to step on all kinds of toes. But again, all we're doing is going to the Word of God. So the first place we're going to go is to the end. I'm going to start at the end and work our way back to the beginning. Revelation 21. We see that the new city of Jerusalem, you know, after God destroys the elements by fire, creates a new heavens and a new earth. I mean, God goes on in great detail about its borders, about its walls, about the gates. Those pearly gates that you hear, literally, like the gate is a giant pearl, a single pearl. It's so cool. Can't wait to see it. Um, but and the, in Revelation 21, God goes through and he de- describes these walls and the borders and the foundations and the city. And he says that all those exist for one purpose. And this is God's word, not mine. To keep everything that is impure out of it. That's the heaven that we're looking forward to. There's only one way into its 12 pearl gates, and that is by, and we all know, faith in Jesus, right? That's it. One way. One way in. Jesus said John in John chapter 10 that anyone who tries to enter in any other way is a thief and a robber. They don't belong there. They're trying to get in by other means. They're trying to steal the kingdom of heaven, rob from the people of God. Now, but here's the reality. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God. Everyone. There's an open invitation. I mean, the doors are wide open. The welcome mat has been laid. Jesus said, let anyone who wants to come, come on in. You know, and literally the Bible says every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. There's an open invitation into the kingdom of heaven. However, there's only one way to enter through it, faith in Christ. If anyone tries to get any other way, they're stealing. Jesus spoke many, many parables about what the kingdom of heaven is like. In several, he explained what will happen to those thieves who try to break in from some other way other than faith in Jesus. Looking at just the gospel of Matthew alone, you'll find several parables about this. In chapters 8, chapter 13, Lots of them in that one. Chapter 22, chapter 24, chapter 25. Jesus quoted over and over and over again what the kingdom of heaven is like and what it's going to be like for people who try to thieve and not enter in by faith in him. Jesus said this about them. Throw them outside, out into the darkness, out into the blazing furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, that's not very Christ-like, Jesus, is it? Throw them out into the darkness, into the fiery furnace, out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, torment forever. That's what Jesus said would happen to anyone who tries to force themselves into heaven any other way. Now, all that God does is good. All that Jesus says is right. That's what Jesus said. If the perfect kingdom of heaven has borders and walls with specific ways to enter in, and yes, there must be ways to enter in, it's not right for us to completely shut them down and not let the right people in. And if there's harsh consequences for those who break in, then vote for leaders who agree with God, who agree with that concept. That is the only way that this nation will stay good and ensure that the people trying to enter in for the purpose of causing us harm are kept out. We have family members that recently, very recently immigrated to to the country, and they did it by the right right way, and they are blessed by it. And they have freedom in this country that they don't have in the other nation they came from. You know, family members that are enjoying the freedom of this nation. There is a way, and it's it's good. It's good. It's very good. Um, Now, if someone knocks on my door and comes in at my invitation, I treat them like a guest. I do whatever I can to show them hospitality, to meet their needs, In fact, this is a command. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. 
For by doing so, some of you have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Pretty cool, right? Someone knocks on my door and I say, come on in, I'm going to show them hospitality. Someone busts my window and climbs in in the middle of the night, they're not going to be met with hospitality. I'm sorry. They're going to be met with whichever choice of gun is closest. And they're not going to be asked to leave my home. They're going to be commanded to leave it. Or they're going to be chewing lead, you know? I mean, it's just, I'm sorry. And it's not because I hate that person. It's because I love my family. And if they're coming in by means that (laughs) are not right, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have a conversation with them about their intentions of entering my home. They're going to get out, and then we'll talk about it, maybe, but probably not. (laughs) Right? I mean, come on. It's because you love your family. If you love this nation, vote for people who love this nation. Vote for leaders who will value well-defined, well-enforced borders. However, God's word does not stop there when it comes to the topic of immigration or the border by any means. As God developed Jacob's family into the nation of Israel, he gave them civil laws to govern them. And no, we're not Jewish. We're grafted into the Jewish faith, you know, and adopted into the family. But again, these are God's principles. If the civil laws that he developed for his nation worked, then I think they would work well for us too. They're just principles. He was very specific about how his people were to treat immigrants and foreigners living among them. I'm just going to quote from a few, but there's a ton of them. God is very clear about how to treat um, those who immigrate into the country. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. Leviticus 19.33-34, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you are foreigners in Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. So vote for leaders who will treat those who immigrate through proper channels as if though they were native born citizens, and those who enter any other way as thieves and robbers. I mean, God's word is clear. And again, I could go on and on and on. There's so many scriptures about this. You know, if they immigrate properly, then they're no longer immigrants, they're citizens. Because, I mean, come on, you don't have to go very far back in history. I don't know many of us who are native born. I think Joe's got some in his blood, but none of us are Native Americans, you know. We, we're all immigrants. Or, and it's really cool because we're into, like, ancestry and stuff, and you can see where your, your family came from, you know. You know, Believe it or not, Cromer, like, we're very German, Austrian. It, yeah, uh, it's really cool to see those who, who um, of your ancestors emigrated and how that happened. It's really cool. So anyways... Yeah, we got to take both sides, <laughs> literally both sides of the fence here. You know, those who immigrate properly, don't mistreat them. But those who come in by any other way, well, they need to go. Now, this is a cool idea. I cannot find, and you guys can correct me on this because I, it was just me and my research, I couldn't find before the biblical text any account of these existing cities of refuge. To my knowledge, this was God's idea. The nation of Israel was the first nation to have cities of refuge. You can correct me on that because I could be wrong on that, but I couldn't find any examples of it. Now, to be clear, so whenever God, you know, they went in their promised land and he's allotting the different land, Levites, they were the priests, but the Levites also were given six different cities that they were to set apart as cities of refuge. They were giving to Levi Numbers 35. Now, these were not lawless places where anybody could go to escape justice. That's sort of the American city of refuge idea that we're starting to see here. That is not at all what a city of refuge was by God's standard. These were, however, these six cities that were given to the Levites, they were to be safe places the Levites were commanded to protect them, you know? They, they, these are some arm, armed dudes, you know? You do not mess with them. They were to protect these people. The people that they were to protect in these cities of refuge was somebody who accidentally killed another person. They could run to these cities of refuge and hide until they stood trial. 
until they stood strong. And the Bible goes through all kinds of specific details. Like if you have, mali- but the, the, the essence is this. If you have malicious intent, city of refuge ain't for you. You're not going to find refuge there. You're going to find justice there. <laughs> but if you're working construction and you drop a boulder on someone's head and they die, you better I tell it to that city of refuge, you know, because that person's family is going to be like, what? But it was an accident. You didn't mean to do it, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on, you know, about all these different details. But that was the essence of it. Cities of refuge were places to go if you accidentally took someone's life and you stayed there until your trial date, before you st- until you stood before the judge, well, stood before the people in these instances and were judged for your actions. They were safe places for those who did not have harmful intent, but rather accidentally took someone else's life. So vote for leaders who do not support cities of refuge being a safe haven for intentionally malicious criminals where they escape justice. That was never God's idea for a city of refuge. It was a safe holding place until justice was administered, however the people decided. Next, so those are sort of the three topics, cities of refuge, how we treat immigrants and foreigners and borders and and protection. That's what God's word has to say about these topics. And if there's more, share with me for sure, because there's no way I can include all of it. But if you're like, "Uh, what about this one, Pastor? Yeah, shoot me up later. And well, don't shoot me up later. Email me or text me. We've got to be careful in today's society. (laughs) Please don't shoot me because I shoot back. Um, (laughs) They want to say hit me up later. Like, I don't know, whatever. Contact me. We'll talk about it, and I'll correct myself next week. I've been known to do that before. Okay, next, the economy. Isn't everybody just loving this economy that we've been having? Isn't it awesome? Y'all know I picked up another job, you know? I mean, woo, this is great, wonderful. Love it, love it. Okay, anyways, you know I'm being sarcastic. God speaks often on the topic of finances. In the New Testament is one of the most, it's, it's what Jesus talked about most finances. Now on a national level, it's important for us to vote for leaders who will be good stewards, good stewards of the vast riches that God has blessed this nation with. I mean, we are a blessed nation. You name it, we got it. It's here. It is here from sea to shining sea. In between, you're going to find that resource. It is so cool. Wow. I mean, you look at these cities that I know my families grew up in, most of your families probably grew up in, these coal towns, you know, you should have seen, you know, like Sagamore, Yatesboro, New Mine, even, even where we lived in New Mine here, you know, I mean, it's so cool to see what they used to be whenever we took advantage of the resources underneath our feet. And of course, we've got natural gas, and we also do. We've got plenty of sun, wind, water, nuclear power. I mean, we've got it all. We've got so much access to sources of energy that we should never have to rely on another nation for anything. We've been so blessed by God that we should be the head, not the tail, in just about every aspect, right? So many, not only natural resources, but we have so many people. Oh my goodness, the people we have. We've got hard workers. We've got innovative and intelligent people with cutting-edge ideas. We've got wise people who understand how to manage resources well. We've got so many skilled and talented people who serve with excellence. I mean, my goodness, we have no reason to ever be dependent on anybody for anything. It's all right here. We've got it. We've got the resources. We've got the people. We have the finances. We've got it. It's amazing how blessed we have been. We hit the lottery whenever we were born here in the United States of America. I mean, even the least of these and the poorest of these, they really aren't that poor compared to other nations. Wow. But it requires something. It requires, and really it's the American dream, right? Independence. Attributes and character traits that God values. Independence, self-reliance. The ability to work hard and actually make something of your life and contribute something to society and to the rest, uh, rest of the world. But look at just a few of these scriptures. Again, and there's way too many to go to today, but here's a few. Um, 1 Timothy 5.8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 
I mean, these are character traits and, and values that God has given to his people. you got to work hard. If you don't provide for your own household and your own relatives, then you're worse than an unbeliever. You've denied the faith. Don't kill the messenger. That's what God's word says. And he says more about it. If you, he said to make it your ambition in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work hard with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so you won't be dependent on anybody. Proverbs 14 and 23, all work brings profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Second Colonians, second Colonians, second Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. You can tell how I'm really afraid to give this message because I, I don't like giving messages like this, but it's God's message, so whatever. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, stay away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. You yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. And what is their example? This is what Paul talked about. We were not idle when we were with you. We didn't eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, we did it in order to offer ourselves up as a model for you to imitate. And you guys know a couple of years ago, I did extensive teaching about this when I went by vocational. It's not wrong to make your living off of the gospel. It's absolutely right to do so. Those who, you know, you don't, what was the, the scripture? You don't tread a, an ox while it's muzzle, nuzzling, muzzling. You don't muzzle an ox while it's treading. Uh, you, you guys know the idea, right? <laughs> But they decided, even though they had the right to just preach and teach and make their living off the gospel and, you know, and to eat each, everyone's food and everything, they chose to set the example. They worked day and night, toiling, paying for everything that they had so they wouldn't be a burden on anyone. In fact, Paul went on and he said, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who's unwilling to work shall not eat. You don't work, you don't eat. I'm not saying I've ever had that conversation with my nearing 20-year-old child by any means, you know. Dude, if you're out on your own and you had no money, what would happen? What would happen? Yeah, you wouldn't have dad's pantry to dig into and bedroom and electricity and internet and yeah, anyways, right? Verse 11, we hear, Paul said, we hear, is some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference. Not busy, busy bodies. What's being produced? Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Settle down and earn the food you eat. Earn it, son. <laughs> so vote for leaders who will provide opportunities for people to do this. we got a lot of innovative and hardworking people. They just need the chance, right? They need the opportunity to put their hard work, their innovation, their wisdom, their skills, their talents to work. To benefit not only themselves, but it benefits everybody as a nation when, when everyone's putting their God-given skills and talents to work. And when it comes to the issue of national debt, I mean, my goodness, do we, look at the debt clock. It is insane. I can't imagine running a household, let alone a nation, with the amount of debt that we have right now. <sighs> Romans 13, 8. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Good job, Georgie. Romans 13, 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The Bible says, doesn't say not to go into debt, but you've got to go into only the debt that is critically necessary that you can pay back. Because most of us sitting here know what it feels like to be head over heels in debt. When you're stuck making minimums and then all of a sudden you can't make minimums. And what's the cliche? You're robbing Peter to pay Paul and you're just pushing things off. Man, that is a stressful way to live. That hurts. That's hard. It's a really hard way to live. Proverbs 22, verse 26 to 27. Do not be one who shakes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. We call that co-signing in today's language. If you lack the means to pay, your very bet will be snatched out from under you. 
I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I think I know of several of us who have co-signed a loan, and the next thing you know, you became responsible to pay that loan. Bank isn't very generous toward, oh, I'm so sorry about your circumstances. Man, that person should have paid. No, they'll come after you. So use wisdom in this. It's, it's rough. So avoid debt, work hard, right? That's, that's the principles of, of God's economy. You work hard and, and you earn it. But we can't neglect our final issue. And this is a big hot topic issue in our nation. Social services. Social services. Yes, God values hard work and independence. Not being dependent on anybody. He values that. But that doesn't mean that he lacks compassion toward those who legitimately cannot provide for their own needs. Those who are forced to be dependent on others. God values hard work, but his heart breaks and he is compassionate toward those who can't. Those who can't. Again, you've got both sides of the fence here, and the Bible is clear about both of them. It's not one or the other. God's kingdom is a kingdom of and. Both simultaneously exist. They are not contradictory. They are complementary. And we go into some of these scriptures. James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And when you look at the, the context of when these things were written, I mean, it was primarily the church who would provide for the needs of these people, widows and orphans. They had no other choice. They couldn't go work on their own, and if they were a widow without family, they had no one else they could rely on. So it is up to us to look after those who can't support themselves. Proverbs 28, 27, those who give to the poor will lack nothing. <laughs> That's a pretty cool principle, right? You can't outgive God. Those who give to the poor will never lack anything. But those who close their eyes to the poor receive many curses. Check your heart in this issue. If ends are really hard to meet, how do you view people who are poor among you? Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, he said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they'll invite you back and you'll be repaid. I don't know about you all, but whenever I throw a party, those are the first people on my list, my friends, my family, my neighbors, you know, all, all my, my, my people, my tribe. Jesus said this instead, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You'll be blessed. Although they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Ka-ching, eternal reward. Jesus gave us a parable explaining how he takes the way we treat the least among us from worldly standards personally. He ended it saying this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40 to 43. Jesus said, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He takes it personally. And then listen to how he also takes it personally when we don't take care of the least of those among us. Then he will say to those on his left, get out of here, depart from me. You're cursed. Get into the eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. He's casting people into hell here. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing. I was a stranger, I didn't get an invitation. I needed clothes, you didn't give me any. I was sick, I was in prison, you never came to visit. He takes it personally, the way that we treat the least of these. Those who genuinely need these social services. If we don't provide them, I mean, Jesus, whew, he's talking hell, eternal fire. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity to do, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Do good to all people. The Apostle Paul was arranging a collection from all the churches to help out the church in Jerusalem during a time of their need. And he explained in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. 
Now, this is a word that makes me cringe in our nation right now, but it's in the Bible, so I need to get uncringed about equality. You know? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if I had it up here or not. Our desire is not that others would be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there would be equality. At the present time, they have plenty. <laughs> They've got an abundance. So their plenty will supply the need in Jerusalem. And then in turn, their plenty in Jerusalem will supply what you need when the time comes for you to have need. Because there are times and seasons for everything under the heavens. There are times when you're going to be, what's the word today, dripping. Dripping? I don't know. Is that a year too old? I don't know. I'm trying to catch up on all this young slang on the buses. And I got to ask my kids what this means. And there are going to be times when you're broke. <laughs> and so you help people when, when you're blessed and when you have plenty. And then you receive that whenever you're in need. And so there is equality. There is equality in the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 4. No one was ever in need. From time to time when people had extra property, they'd sell it off and they'd give the money to the, uh, to the leaders in the church. The leaders in the church would give it to those in need. So there was never a need. It's so cool. In fact, they quote the Old Testament. The goal here is equality. For as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have much, too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. And I, and I believe this is in the context of manna. They collected exactly what they needed. If they tried to hoard it, it would mold, and they wouldn't be able to use it. Every day, their daily need was met. And the day before the Sabbath, double came. They always had exactly what they needed. That is our God. He'll give you exactly what you need for today. Don't worry about tomorrow, because what did Jesus say about tomorrow? It's got its own troubles coming your way. <laughs> they're, they're coming. So don't worry about it. Just deal with today, one day at a time. When there is true and legitimate need, and it is in the power of others to help those needs, it's good for them to help. However, this should be encouraged and not forced. And that's a challenge facing our nation, the issue with this. Also, there's a delicate balance in any program or service that meets human need. They should meet the need, but not enable people to be needy. You get the idea there? Meet the need, but not continue those people to be needy. That's the difference between helping and enabling. And it's a very delicate balance, and it requires wisdom. All social services should have the end goal of equipping those who can be independent with a path to independence. They should be need-based and neutral toward identity factors. You guys know where I'm going with this, right? There's so many social services that are targeted toward groups of people based on whatever, their, their skin color, their ethnicity, their religion, their physical locations. It should just be based on the need. doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter your gender. It should just meet the need of whoever needs it. In fact, the church faced this complaint very early on in their food pantry program. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, whoo, that church was growing. And you know what happens when the church grows? Problems. <laughs> the problems grow too. Church pains grow. So when the number of disciples is increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained. Now church folk never complain, do they? Y'all never complain. No, I complain too. Oh Lord, forgive us. But they were complaining against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered the disciples together and said it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables and to provide food. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and full of wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so again, the church used the wisdom given of the Holy Spirit to choose people, and this is where the whole idea of deacons came into play. They oversaw the, the, the food pantry program to distribute food every day to the widows who had need and to make sure that nobody went without, 
that there was no favoritism, that nobody was overlooked, whether they were um, Hebraic Jews or whether they were Hellenistic Jews, that all the widows received food equally. It's really cool. They faced that head on, and that's how they dealt with it. They delegated that responsibility so that it would be handled well. So if national leaders are given the power and the authority (laughs) to be Robin Hood-like figures, to steal from the rich and to give to the poor, because that's that's the idea of social services in in a lot of uh, politicians' minds right now, let me tell you, no human being on the face of the earth can handle that kind of power and authority well. It's going to corrupt them. Once you start taking billions of dollars from people and it's yours to do whatever you want with, it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. It will eventually lead to the lack of desire for people to do well for themselves because it's just going to get stolen away anyways and given to people who will not work for their living. So we need to vote for leaders who have a great deal of wisdom And honestly, you can only discern that through prayer and fasting. Somebody who has the wisdom to know how to manage social services well so that needs are met, but they are not continued to be needy. So that the services are provided, but not from stealing from those, but by motivating and encouraging generosity so that others willingly give into those programs. Oh my goodness, we, we need wisdom, and our leaders need wisdom in how to run programs such as this. So next week, we're going to continue looking at issues. We're going to start with a big one, abortion. Woo! We're going to start with that next week, one of the issues that we're going to talk about. And you, you may be a little surprised on some of these things about what God's Word teaches, so please come on out. But right now, that's what God's Word has to say about all the issues facing our nation. But... We know the true solution for all these problems. So right now we're going to turn away from all those issues and we're going to reunite together again and focus on what matters, what unites us. Because in the end, all of these social issues, all of these judicial issues, all of these civil issues that face our nation with the upcoming vote and the upcoming election, they're going to be gone and forgotten about. And so that's why it's important for us when our blood starts boiling and we start getting frustrated and we can't win people over to our side, we remember, we remember what really matters. And that's Christ. He who was crucified. He who stands in the heavens day and night interceding for you. He's with you. He's for you. And he alone is who unites us with all of our different views and all of our different perspectives, all of our different backgrounds into one body that above all loves one another and serves the needs of one another. That's what truly matters in this heated political environment. This is what brings us together. And so right now, we're going to celebrate communion together As we remember, we remember and we honor the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because one other thing that we all share in common is we're all sinners in need of a Savior. All of us. All of us. We are desperate for Christ. And so let's just pray together. So Jesus, today we just confess our need for you. You know who we are. You know the sinful decisions we've been making. But we know when we come running to you, Jesus, there's grace. There's mercy. There's forgiveness. You know our need and our desires. And in your kingdom, God, there is an abundance to meet every need with a blessing that brings life. So Jesus, we thank you for making a way where there is no other way. And we pray right now you'd forgive us of all of our sins. Intentional and unintentional, Lord. We surrender all that we are 
to you. And we pray, Jesus, that you would work my life out for good in a way that would bring glory to you, to your name, to your kingdom, to your people. Jesus, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us and for uniting us together as one people in your name. Amen. Amen.